Um, so we're here, of course, for a discussion of the 1954 film, Salt of the Earth, directed by Herbert J. Biberman, um, an important, but at the time, extremely controversial uh, neorealist film based on the true events of a 1951 strike uh, in New Mexico, uh, led by Mexican-American, Nuevo Mexicano, uh, zinc miners, and just as importantly, um, as we'll discuss, of course, their spouses. Um, and the film has since become a, a classic of uh, feminist and Chicano, Chicana, Chicanex cinema. Uh, Biberman uh, was one of the infamous Hollywood 10 filmmakers cited for um, contempt of Congress after they refused to answer questions about their alleged involvement with the Communist Party. Um, so Gabriel, can you talk to us just a little bit about um, your recent book project, which of course spends a great deal of time discussing Salt of the Earth, um, Hidden Chicano Cinema, uh, talk to us a little bit about how this project came to be um, and kind of the role that Salt of the Earth perhaps plays in it. Sure, be happy to do that. Um, so Hidden Chicano Cinema now was published in uh, 2013 from Rutgers University. And um, the approach in that book, the approach that I use to that book is, um, it, I was conceptually thinking about the issue of uh, the Southwest borderlands in New Mexico in particular, as a, a distant locale, at least at the time when cinema, at the dawn of the age of cinema. So some, in, in addition to the fact that I was teaching Chicano cinema and had been gathering up um, the most noted films that were being defined in the 1980s as Chicano film, Chicano, Chicano film. But I also was interested in, in in um, materials that had been filmed, fugitive though, though they may have been, that is the early the early history of cinema. But more importantly than that, I I, I wanted to understand how early filmmakers understood this region or misunderstood it. And there's equal amounts of both going on. So um, the descriptions of of that period of time, uh, if you think of what filmmakers were saying about the region or what was generally circulating in, in the discourse in the American imaginary was that this place was really foreign, really different, uh, as foreign as other remote parts of the globe. So you might think of Asia and you might think of, um, you might think of uh, Africa, you might think of other parts of the world in which that sort of distance between the metropoli and these colonies was, was in place. And um, that sort of bowled me over to sort of thinking about that. And I began to see that there was verification for that in the early films that were being issued. So keep in mind that um, the Lumiere brothers are developing film technology in Europe and Paris in the, about 1895, 1894, something like that. And by 1898, we have the first signatory company the Edison Company out in the Southwest filming. So they do the first, uh, uh, what was then termed actuality and actuality, like a three minute, three minute filming of the Isleta Day School, which is a right. Native American Pueblo just south of Albuquerque. And they come out and they film just the kids going in and out of, out of the classroom and, and on the playground for about, you know, uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, and so first, uh, the, the notion that that technology would make it out to this part of the, what is now the United States at that day was surprising. And then the question is, well, what, what did they see and what were they, what did they manage to film? So I, um, I wanted to conceptualize this as a kind of theoretical, theoretical, um, platform on a theoretical platform that, uh, that I began to call proxemics, which is just a way of saying the distance between things. And as I imagine this, uh, this encounter, these encounters, the early encounters, and then of course, this is progresses over time. You wanna know if that, 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 that modality of the encounter ever changes. So um, think about a, a triangle, think about a triangle and at the apex, at the F one apex, you place the filmmaker, a person who's desirous of making a film about, in this case, the Southwest borderlands. 
At the other point of the apex would be the subject. Now keep in mind in early in this early process of where the technology is, the technology doesn't doesn't reside with the subjects. They don't have access to that technology or the camera. Call it technology or call it the camera. And the third apex is the um, um, the subject, see, the subject, the camera, and the and the filmmaker. So. Um, as I began to look at, the, at, the, at that early filmmaking, it began became, became clear that filmmakers coming from roughly from the eastern seaboard out to the southwest borderlands had very, very, were very, very unfamiliar with anything they were seeing. They might have been desirous of wanting to film it, but they had very, very superficial understandings, particularly when it came into matters of history, culture, and the experience of peoples who were uh, millennial residents of this, of this region. So, uh, so then the, the, the idea is, well, uh, it's going to produce, of course, distortion. And I think filmmaking itself is going to split into at least two major camps. So one of the major camps is going to be commercial filmmaking, um, in which uh, entertainment is, is the high, high price tag item in making a film. You're doing it to entertain folks and you're doing it for commercial purposes. You want to make money and you're going to, um, you're going to create film dramas, film dramas that uh, you use the standard kind of uh, notation of American cinema, which is to create antagonists and protagonists and uh, protagonists and antagonists. And in this case, it was not to the good of uh, ethnic um, peoples in the, in the borderlands because they almost always invariably became the antagonist to the uh, heroic protagonist. And it could have been any number of subjects that have to do with, with, uh, with Western Americana, let's say. And this is gonna, this is gonna, re this is gonna over time, it'll, it'll, we'll eventually get to salt of the earth and, and to talking about how this formulaic presentation, these, this three act, basically three act narrative structuring of film on the commercial um, entertainment side, you, you know, get to salt of the earth and it is unprecedented in the way it, it, it breaks with those kinds of conventions. But we can talk, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, so um, the other part of this is in this distance between the filmmaker and the subject, there's always this moment of encounter, and the encounter can be, um, if you think of if you think of uh, what the camera does, and you think of a wide angle, a wide angle frame of the subject, and you think of that conceptually. Many times, the filmmakers were so distant and far away from the from the actual subjects they're filming that that they're at a very wide angle. They're very uh, very distort, and that that can lead to distortion. So the close-up, if you follow that analogy, the close-up the close is, is one in which the camera comes right. Of course, today with the technology that filmmakers have, they don't have to be right up in your face, so to speak. Sure. But the close-up at one time meant that you had to occupy a kind of intimate space with your subject. You had to, um, and, and, to and to do that, you had, you had to have the permission of the, of the subject, which means some form of collaboration, some kind of Prearranged uh, decision to uh, to let you come into the intimate space, or um, or it meant you took that you took it you you lifted it you you got in there and you took it without permission, which then can can lead to various antagonisms or ill ill feelings on the part of the subject. I probably forgot I probably neglected to say that the the other split that I believe happens in early film is. Uh, is uh, filmmaking that goes into the ethnographic, into producing yeah. ethnographic registers of ethnic people, and um, and they can they can muck it up too. All you have to think about is um, Nanook of the North, right? Think about that 1920 film about uh, and see how um, a lot of staging and a lot of other things came into what was supposed to be an empirical or some kind of scientific record. So my so the, the, the book itself is deals with two basic things. What were the encounters like between filmmakers and the subjects? 
and where do Mexican Americans fit fit in that in that encounter in, encounter uh, uh, mode, and uh, how how uh, I, I want to use the word authentic, but how how close to verifying the actual lives or situations of of the subject uh, were available to filmmakers, and did that change over time? <clears throat> and and so the the book progresses through. Uh, the 1930s, 1950s, and then gets into Chicano filmmaking. And that triangle will change by the time Chicano and Chicano filmmakers come into possession of the camera, but I would call it the wherewithal and also the gumption to produce their own, their own films. So then you, um, you, you can invert, the triangle kind of becomes inverted and and uh, Mexican Americans are, are making their own films, but you know, there's a lot of distance between those two, two elements. Yeah, thank you so much for that important context um, in terms of the ways in which filmmaking in New Mexico had, had been uh, constructed, how uh, people in New Mexico had been represented um, on screen until this point. Um, and then of, of course, out of this context, we have Salt of the Earth, which is quite an exception in, in many ways to many of those things that you were discussing. Um, so I was wondering, first of all, could you detail just a bit of the film's uh, important production history? Um, why was there such a controversy about its creation? Could you provide us with, with some of those, uh, some of those, some of that background information? Yeah, well, I, I think you mentioned part of that in the introduction, you said that the, um, Filmmakers Biberman and, and others had been uh, identified as part of the Hollywood Ten, and uh, and uh, were brought before the uh, House of Un American Activities Committee. Right. And so, um, filmmakers who were what we might call part of the uh, they were, if not part of the the Communist Party, they were they were associated with folks who were left leaning in their politics. And of course, uh, McCarthyism and the hysteria around uh, red baiting comes into comes into impinge on the work of these filmmakers. So they had already been at work uh, intending to insert progressive policy, policy progressive filmmaking uh, stories and um, and ideas into their craft through using uh, using filmmaking and that uh, form of creativity to to send a message or to create a message. And they were, um, and so they were largely influenced uh, to, or to agree influenced by uh, Soviet film theory. And, um, but then, but you know, again, this thing about the, the, the formulaic representations, the, the working inside of Hollywood and Hollywood is using melodrama. They're using three act narrative structures that usually has a, an opening and a happy, a happy ending and all of that. And oftentimes a, a deep um, romantic plot or a subplot or romantic, there's always that element of that kind of formulaic filmmaking. So they're also coming up against the very way in which filmmaking is, is done in the United States, again, in the commercial, in terms of commercial uh, Filmmaking. I think it's important to keep in mind that independent, what we now see as independent filmmaking or specialty films or things that um, you might see on independent lens or all of that was, there simply wasn't that uh, genre it available. So you, you, the, the one game in town was Hollywood filmmaking and uh, the skill, Screen Actors Guild the um, associations with progressive politics, all of those things had tainted these, the, the filmmakers. So I think um, once Jericho had, uh, Paul Jericho had been up before the, the House on, on American Activities Committee, I, him and Biberman and others decided, you know, we have to film, we have to create our own uh, production company. We have to create the independent production corporation. That's what it's gonna be called and that's what we'll do. And it will allow us independence from, from Hollywood structure, financing and other things to be able to do the kinds of films 
that they thought were important. There had been, and, and some of these filmmakers are, all, are, are also associated with a, a genre of film called the social problem film, which is, uh, which is uh, again, uses Hollywood uh, resources and, and Hollywood uh, studios and so forth. But there are a group of films in the 1950s, particularly that are again crafted by these filmmakers who decide, you know, there are there are ethnic people in the United States and they have social concerns and, and there's this sort of uh, unequal, there are unequal segments of society. We should, we should do films about them, right? So uh, the film, that the, the Mexican American film that I always refer to as a social problem film, and keep in mind Salt of the Earth was, has sometimes been defined as a social problem film. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say more about why I don't think that's the case. But uh, The Ring, 1956 or something like that. Right. The story of a, of a boxer in, in East LA who goes right. up the ranks and then and then uh, he, he wants to be a, a contender, so to speak. Uh, so, so ethnic minorities in film and taking a look at their issues and concerns as part of this social social um, social melodramas. However, they have limitations. So there's no denunciation in a social melodrama. And, and more often than not, than not the protagonist who, who can be a Mexican-American or African-American, so if you think of the film, Nothing But a Man, it features an, an African-American, African-Americans in lead roles, and it's about um, working in, uh, in some very, very, very difficult uh, sawmill work and things. All of those things, uh, what, what often happens in those social problem films is that the protagonist attempt to break, you know, they, they, there's discrimination is, is palpable and it's affecting them and they attempt to uh, move beyond that and they're often returned back to the starting point, right? So those two things, no denunciation and your protagonist returns back to where he started. And that, that's very clear in that film, The Ring. So here again, here's a place where Salt of the Earth just, just busts open those conventions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the political atmosphere of the of the era is what's uh, hampering their work and will eventually um, drive them one to create the uh, the production company and also um, there's some amount of uh, just good fortune fortune that they come out to New Mexico and find out about the strike that was on, ongoing in, in Grand County and that's kind of how they get to um, the place where they're, where they find is, they find a story that they believe is what they need to, um, to, 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 to be true to the, to the, to the progressive ideals that they have. This actually transitions us really nicely to, um, a question that we had later in, in the list that we had, uh, constructed, but that's okay. Cause it, it'll work nicely here. So to, to further expand on, uh, you know, kind of this, uh, filmmaking milieu that's created um, uh, by Salt of the Earth or that um, is fostered by Salt of the Earth. Can you talk about the way in which when the filmmakers come to New Mexico, um, of course you have the legendary uh, Michael Wilson who's, who's um, in charge of writing the screenplay, but the way in which that these um, uh, particular filmmaking norms are really challenged by the ways in which they decide to engage with local community members um, in terms of the script um, the production, the editing as well, from what I understand. Uh, can you talk a bit about the way in which the community is involved with, um, from every step of the process, from writing to, to the production to, to post-production of Salt Absolutely. of the Earth? Absolutely, yeah. So this is, this is, again, a place where Salt of the Earth breaks, just breaks open what, was, what the expectations would have been for how do you do a commercial film? How do you make a commercial film? And even it challenges, uh, the it challenges the ideals of the very very filmmakers as they approach as, as they approach the story. So they learn the story from uh, they learn about uh, the strike at Hanover from uh, uh, Jenny and Vincent uh, Craig, who are also um, politically they're aligned with uh, with the Jerichos and with the Bibbermans and so forth. And uh, they get down to to uh, to salt of the earth and they begin. They begin to uh, to 
conceptualize what the film will be like. Now, uh, Biberman had some experience with this idea of involving uh, non-professional cast members in, in productions. So he had done a play in New York called uh, China, China Roar, in which he had used uh, Asian Americans in the, in, in the cast. And there was this already this sort of uh, willingness to, to uh, bring the people, bring the subject into the filmmaking, right? Uh, in that way. So you're, al you're already developing a kind of collaboration. And that would carry through in Salt of the Earth. So from the get-go, um, Biberman was interested in using a number of local, uh, local um, folks from the union, from the from the uh, mill and, and mine smelters union in the in the film, and it it was um, it was uh, from the beginning there was there was kind of a uh, the notion that they would use people that they knew in Hollywood, but they wanted to to also include uh, people who were living this the strike. So uh, they created a a, a production committee. And this is unheard of because uh, Wilson, uh, Michael Wilson, the scriptwriter, he would drafted out the story. He, first of all, they sat down and listened to the story, the story being told by the, the mining families. You know, what was their what was their situation? What was what was their grievance with the mining company? What happened in, in terms of how you uh, eked out a living there? They listened very intently, and then they draft. Then Wilson drafts out a script. But he also, um, these committees would meet with members of the union and with the filmmakers and they would, and they would hammer it out. They would look at it and, and the committee, the, uh, the community, I should say, had a chance and an opportunity to suggest changes. Uh, now, I was saying that sometimes it challenged the filmmakers' own, own notions because I think Biberman wanted to use a, a, a an actor Mexican origin, but who was not who's a who's a professional and had, had had some film credits, instead of uh, of, of uh, Juan Chacon, right, for to take the the, the role of uh, Ramon Quintero. Uh, so um, I think it was uh, Sonia Dahl Biberman, his wife, and um, Ros Rosaura Revueltas, who had already been brought on to the film set who urged him to use Juan Chacon, the, the local guy. And uh, Biberman had some qualms about it. He said, well, he's, he's kind of shy. He's kind of like, you know, they were just, these, these folks were uh, earning a living, bringing, bringing copper out of the mine. You know, they weren't, they weren't used to this other, this other activity that meant they had to be in front of people and they had to deliver lines and they had to do all of that, that stuff. But eventually, the, the two women, um, their suggestion went out, and Juan Chacon was elected to, to, uh, to do the role. And I think, you know, uh, Bimmerman said, go up into the mountain and study, uh, or Wilson said, go up, into the, up on the hillside there, study the script, and think about everything that happened over the last 300 years that you know of that happened in this community. So in other words, sort of, you know, you know the story internally. Here's the script we're drafting but also to deliver it, think about how important this place is to you, how much carencia you have or sort of attachment to the place. Uh, so that's, that's just unheard of. To, one, to let the, to let the uh, people who are depicted in the film, um, you know, make suggestions about the script and about the portrayals. So um, there was some, something about, uh, you know, again, dealing with stereotypes that had already been established and, and sort of worked into the American imagination about how Mexicans or Mexican Americans behave. You know, there was something like, well, we're going to have, we, Ramon is going to be this uh, hard, hard drinking, uh, partying uh, guy, right, who ends up at the bar every night. And the, the, the people of the community said, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want him. We don't want that depiction. Um, so they, they kind of shaved off some of that coarseness of just um, uh, pre-judged um, pre sort of issues around the community. Uh, and it just goes, I think eventually there were uh, nine local 
members of the cast and, and six professional, that is folks that they knew from Hollywood who came out. So on that level, it was like, um, you know, the other part of this is that folks often talk about how does this film supposed to be, how do you classify this film? I said, well, some people call it a social problem film. It goes beyond that because it's denunciation and it's in your face about, about the inequity and the, and the labor issues and the gender issues and the, the, women's, the women's role. Yeah, that was my, that's the next question. I think we can, we can try to talk through a bit. Um, so as obviously as important as all of these history, histories are in your book, you, talk, you do talk about how uh, the Salts of the Earth's focus on, on women is truly remarkable. Um, and the film has obviously become um, a classic of, of feminist cinema as well. Could you um, expand a bit on this history? Uh, why is the role of um, Mexican film actress, uh, actress uh, Revueltas, who, who we talked about, so important? Um, and we might even recall that in terms of narratively, the film, of course, begins with Esperanza saying that what we're about to watch is, is her story. Um, so can we talk a bit about, a bit, um, about that for a moment? Yeah, Esperanza carries the narration right from the, you know, she, the, the narrating voice that comes in right in the first, in the opening sequence is, is Esperanza. And uh, Revueltas was, uh, had film credits in Mexico. She was an established film actress. She knew of, uh, she had also shared uh, progressive politics in that way. And, um, and I think she's just an absolute wonderful choice, right? Because she wasn't that far away from working communities herself. Um, so then that the others in the, in listening to the story of the strike, of course, it, 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 they were made aware, the filmmakers were made aware about that and they probably knew about it because they, they were aware of such things. The Taft, the Taft Hart, Hartley Act, right? That had, had made it impossible for the striking miners to stay on the picket lines. And therefore the women took up that role and they did it through a democratic process in the union hall. You know, there's that famous scene in, there's that famous scene in Salt of the Earth where uh, they're discussing this development you know, the government, uh, the government coming in and saying, you know, we're going to arrest the, the picketing miners. And then this sort of uh, breaking again, uh, going outside the, uh, the expected frames and say, well, the women, the auxiliary will take on the, the striking role. And from that moment on, there this, there's this, again, this business of the external story told inside the film is as now it, it's, it's as riveting, but it's also as determinative about the question of women, gender, uh, households, mining households, and um, and how the the structuring of the the, uh, the company town affects families, affects the women primarily, you know, uh, and uh, so that is again they by by pushing that idea forward. And, and of course, with the heightened, the heightened sort of uh, role that Esperanza has, I mean, her, her, opening, her opening dialogue is about um, how that place had always been uh, part of the Mexican community, the Mexican American community, they were ancestral peoples and how she is uh, pregnant with a child and she, uh, it fears, she fears the future because the conditions are, are dire. They're becoming more dire. And, and, and what they face, what the women face is equal to what the men face. Although in American society at that time, it, 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 there were few ways to understand that. And I think Salt of the Other just puts it in, some, in a juxtaposition that's unbelievably um, uh, clear. Um, and and first goes further because it does the role the role reversal right, so so the guys who are no longer on the picket strike, uh, you know have to tend to the children and have to wash the clothes and then, you know, uh, and and so there's this role, role reversal that again, uh, it's just is completely, com completely uh, unexpected in that way. Continue um, with with uh, that idea of. of uh, the reversals that occur, um, it seems to me that there are a number of moments in the film where we might imagine that Esperanza or 
um, or Ramon will take the lead in terms of the narrative structure, but we have um, instead other faces in the community that oftentimes um, become the agents in these sort of catalytic moments in the film. Um, so thinking about the Union Hall, like you mentioned, um, or even the end of the film, of course, where it's not uh, you know Esperanza or Ramon per se saving the day, it's in fact the community collectively coming together. Um, so can you talk a bit about uh, perhaps why the film in this really beautiful fashion seems to consistently hesitate in making the story totally about um, the protagonist, the, you know, this, this couple, of course. Yeah, I think that's, that's another place where, um, where again, uh, filmmakers are drawing, um, their influence is coming from uh, montage theory, film theory, and this sort of idea that, um, that uh, you, you, montage and Soviet, Soviet uh, film theory in opposition to commercial, commercial filmmaking, commercially Hollywood filmmaking. So what, what would be expected in commercial Hollywood film, filmmaking is this sort of trite uh, romantic story, you know, that would put, that would elevate the two characters up to this place where their, their emotional, uh, their emotional uh, valence is, is sometimes more important than the communities. But they avoided that. They avoided that through the, uh, through the uh, union hall uh, uh, scenes and through the, uh, and through letting the collective voice circulate through the through the community, Clint, also there's uh, Clinton Jenks who comes in the the, the, uh, the union organizer and he, you know they're part they're part of it too. The uh, it's that one sequence where there's a uh, a dance going on, a celebration going on in one of the homes. You know they can see and and you can see the. Uh, the union organizers learning from the community. They're learning about what, you know, what's this celebration about? Why do you have Benito Juarez on the wall? Why do you have the Virgen de Guadalupe on the wall? Those are all things that are sort of then, they, they, uh, they also uh, percolate through the, through the storytelling. And the last scene, the final scene, the final scene of the eviction of the, of the mining family and everyone responding, it's all about collective action. So it's organizing and collective action, and that that dimension of the film is not lost. It's not given up to say let's have a happy ending at the end. There's a kind of triumphal ending because right. the, it, the the eviction is stopped, right? And it's stopped through the force of community coming in to do that. But it's not you know happy you know happy ha happy ever after. It's so. Oh, and yeah, with us, of course. We haven't talked about her uh, and and the fact that she, she ends up being part of the part of the forces that are arrayed against the filmmakers and and um, she will be picked up on an immigration visa and then faces a judge in El Paso and has to return to Mexico and so the final I always did when I taught the film I always pointed to the the final montage at the end where Esperanza is speaking in front of a house and that was that was never that wasn't filmed on location that was filmed in Mexico so to to complete sort of the the narration and of course she she uh, she completed the film is completed that way and you mentioned uh, of course uh, the the aspect in terms of the involvement of the union I was wondering whether you could speak um, a bit more to that history I think you mentioned how there might even be some archival documents at the Union Hall uh, that that are still kind of waiting to be uncovered. But what role do, does the Union play in terms of in terms of um, the the creation of the film? Uh, yeah, yeah, they were they were with it right from the outset. Once once Biberman and um, visits visits uh, Grant County and uh, Hanover, they they approached the the Union and the Union wants to, they want that story told. So they're with it from the beginning. They also support, um, as to the extent possible, they, they support the uh, distribution of the film. You know, there is a, a premiere in, in Silver City, which is pretty surprising to learn about in like 54. And that goes over sort of well. It's, it, it's you know, it's, it's not a world premiere, I guess, because it, Silver City is such a small town, but uh, the local press starts to um, 
to talk about how well the projection, the, the what's projected in the film is really, these are really like Mexican immigrants that are newly arrived in the United States that are the bulk of the community. They're not this old Spanish Americans that were part and parcel of New Mexico, right? So there's a sort of, they're, they're attacking the film in terms of like it's agitating and, and, and those aren't really the people of New Mexico that we know. So there was that um, immediately, as soon as the films aired and screened, that happened. But a lot of the, a lot of the distribution of the film as, as the filmmakers ran into uh, contracts being uh, canceled and limited film distribution and theatrical, uh, theatrical uh, contracts that were never followed through it on, uh, never followed through with. They, uh, the union does a letter writing campaign and they, uh, you know, they ask for support of the film and they also uh, find venues for showing the films in other union halls across, across the, the country. So um, they just, uh, that was, you know, what the community in this instance, in this story, the community and the union are kind of one and the same. You know, they're, they're drawing from the same, that's their livelihood. And if, you, if you've been, even if you go down to, uh, to Hanover and Grant County today, um, it's, quite, it's quite the story is that copper is like one of the few, one of the few uh, industries in that part of, also in, in Arizona on the, the other side of, of the line too. So we have this really, um, as, you, as you mentioned, this really interesting work being done uh, by the union to distribute the film. But of course, the film is, is w uh, widely known today for being, uh, quote unquote, the only blacklisted uh, US film. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk for just a moment about its uh, reception, which of course is, is quite important um, as well in this history. Well, there's a whole suppression of salt of the earth that follows in the 1950s. And, uh, and the, the filmmakers are, because they're locked out of Hollywood, one, by creating this new production company and by being tainted, by being red baited, they're, they're, they immediately face difficulties in terms of getting the film distributed. They do have some limited success I, in, in some urban area, I think in Detroit and in New York, there's some runs of the film that do pretty well. They get um, union supporters and other people out. Uh, but in terms of Hollywood distribution and theatrical distribution, that becomes a, just ever more challenging. And interestingly enough, it's um, Howard Hughes who uh, orchestrates the, uh, the suppression of Salt of the Earth because he was uh, very, very influential in Hollywood, bankrolled a lot of filmmaking, had uh, sway over the Screen Actors Guild. And at one point he writes a letter to, uh, to a US Senator and he says, I understand this film is recently, uh, is about to be uh, uh, completed. And uh, he uh, immediately attacks the credentials of the filmmakers. He says they're not, they, they don't have the expertise or the, or the wherewithal to make such a film. Uh, and, uh, and then he lists five or six points that, that should be done to lock, to ensure that the lockout from, from the Hollywood system is, is, uh, takes, takes hold. You know, like uh, no technical assistance with editing and, a number of a number of different things, um, political, you know, some political. Um, there's uh, folks on the, uh, you know, U.S. senators and others who are investigating the the film. There's a general kind of um, uh, dismissal of the film, you know, and there's like, is it a Hollywood film, and why is it so political, and why is it creating this agitation, why is it on the side of, of um, uh, unionism, but unionism with, with uh, quite a severe critique of, of the um, politics of the economy at that time. Before we, um, in just a few minutes, begin taking some audience questions, I did want to make sure that we um, within your book, uh, returning to, you know, kind of the starting point of the conversation, uh, you do spend uh, quite a bit of time doing this really interesting comparison between Salt of the Earth 
and the 1966 film uh, Annal Miguel, another film created in this Cold War context. Um, can you talk just for a moment about why that comparison was um, important and, and useful for your work? Well, it's part of uh, both films come out of this sort of uh, Cold War hysteria. And uh, the other film, it's a minor film in a, in a sense, it's also a little bit difficult to, to categorize as a film. It's not quite ethnography and it is quite US State Department propaganda in a sense because it was sponsored by, by uh, the State Department. So um, Joseph Krungold uh, makes this film. He comes out to Taos, New Mexico at the northern, northern New Mexico where close to where the Vincents are. And he decides that he wants to make a film about this uh, family that um, they're shepherds, they're sheep raisers, and they uh, follow an ancient uh, practice of uh, transhumans. They take the, the sheep from their ranches up into the mountains. And, um, and it's right before world, it's right before the Korean War. It's right as the Korean War is breaking out. So uh, the older brother in the film gets a letter from the Selective Service. He's happy to go serve his country because that's what's been done there for generations. Um, there's a great deal, great deal of attachment to place. And Krungol was asked to create this film so that it could be sent to Latin America and other parts of the world. And that it would, and the, and the idea was, let's not give a green tiled uh, Thanksgiving view of America, Americana to the rest of the world, especially to our allies in Latin America. So let's show this working, essentially it's a working family, an agro pastoral family that has these deep roots and they have these deep traditions. And, um, and that's what will, that's, that's what should go out to speak favorably about the United States, to, to say the United States is, is diverse in the way people carry on their, their livelihoods and so forth. The, uh, the issue, of course, is that um, it, that film misses a lot of the grievances that people in northern New Mexico had about, for example, the Forest Service and whether they could graze their livestock on the Forest Service, which is now controlled by the federal government. It, it completely askews social issues and it's done. But, but the reason I bring these two films together is because it, it offers two representations of Mexican Americans at, from exactly the same time period and within this context of what's at stake within Cold War politics and loyalty to the nation or, uh, or in terms of organizing as a political force, a union um, force of workers to uh, organize for your rights, right? So within the general, within the American imaginary, both, both of them are sort of equally unusual. You know, there's not a lot of representations of Mexican Americans in film in that period of time. Then all of a sudden here you get these two and they're, they're pitted one against the other in a sense. They're, they're, uh, one is uh, loyalty, patriotism, um, um, not rocking the boat kind of thing. Uh, there's nobility in that in that representation because there had also been some work from the uh, FSA photographers who had worked up in that area too, and were looking at the people in their pastoral communities. So there's nobility built into that, and um, but but it is just sort of so interesting that they come up. They're 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 they're, they're, uh, they're from the same moment. And they're conditioned by, by Cold War politics. Uh, one uh, common thread, it seems, that's coming up in, in the audience questions, uh, which is another uh, question that we also have here, which is really interesting, is we have these really unique moments in the films in terms of, as you mentioned, um, the, the image of Mexican uh, President Benito Juarez. We have the sounds of, uh, of Nuevo Mexicano folk music. Um, the flow of Spanish and Spanglish in the film. Um, so I know for me, as I mentioned earlier, I was reminded of Shaw and Stan's work on unthinking Eurocentrism. Um, so how do these sorts of moments work towards challenging certain filmmaking norms or conventions um, and bringing attention to the cultures um, of these New Mexican communities? Yeah, I think that that speaks really well to the, to the disposition of the filmmakers to want to get it right. So again, the distance, if we're talking about the old films, 
that I admit, that I start that I start the book with, the distance between the culture and the filmmakers is too great. So they're they're either distorting or they're or they're not getting it right. Once you get into this collaborative mode, and, and these filmmakers were, were very interested in making sure that they listened and the touches of the of the culture and what it meant were presented in in the way the community wanted wanted them to be presented. And that's just totally un, unusual. Uh, keep in mind that they're it's a hybrid film. It's it's not a commercial, it's not a commercial entertainment film where people come in and they they think they know what the you know the Native Americans sound like, or how they dress, or put some Plains Indian in there. That will that'll do good. No, they're coming in at, at it with a very a, a lot of sensitivity about that. And uh, you're also by using the non-professional cast, these people speak the way people in Grant County spoke at that time. They're not putting on any special accents. They, in fact, I think they wanted to use Mexican Americans rather than Mexican actors. I guess that was one one consideration because they would not have a thick accent in delivering English lines. In fact, it would be their they were bicultural, they're bilingual, so they they could deliver the lines in both English or Spanish or or do some code switching, as you said, you know, going back and forth. So it, it all it all is is much more um, evidence of the way of the way people lived in that community. And it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's good. It does a good job at that. It does, um, uh, there's, uh, so I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that gives us um, a lot to, to think about. Um, transitioning to some of the audience questions here. So we have a great question from uh, Mario Garcia. Um, so he asks if the film was shown um, in Mexico, in terms of its um, in terms of its distribution, so perhaps you could give us a bit of a sense of some of the international um, channels that it traveled and um, the successes that it found. Right? Yeah. Thanks for that question, Mario. That's great. Um, yeah. It 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 also was um, was screened in Mexico City, and it it did really well. People people uh, could relate to the film. The uh, audiences went out in large numbers. It was one of the revenue streams that the filmmakers had that they could sort of rely on because as things started to close down in the US, the theatrical distribution, uh, that was still a source of income for the, for the, for the filmmakers to cover costs. So it, it, uh, I don't know of other parts of Latin America, but certainly in, in Mexico City, it was, it was viewed and screened and, uh, and got uh, a really great reception. Uh, we guess we should add that into the uh, 1960s and into the 1970s, there, there's a gradual diminishment of the awareness of the film. It, 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 it's, it, it fades from, from, uh, from American life, from, Ameri from screenings, but it's in the 1970s where again, it's picked up by, uh, and it's interesting, we, we, we started talking about this, how it, uh, it, it has uh, several themes that speak to different different communities. There's a labor, so it was picked up as a labor film in the 70s as activism took hold. It was picked up as American, a Mexican American or Chicano film. I mentioned in the book that uh, the local uh, UMAS, United Mexican American Student Association at, at the University of New Mexico, wanted to bring the film, and they got some they got some uh, pushback from the governor's office or something. This is in the 1970s. And then uh, uh, it became a, a, a de, de rigueur film in feminist studies. So you have a, a labor, feminist, uh, ethnic studies. It all speaks to those various communities and it's rediscovered uh, out of those kinds of uh, a relook at the at the film again. Look, going back to look for films that depicted uh, any of those struggles. Right? And we have another question here from uh, Benjamin uh, Martinez, who asks: um, In today's television industry, representation is a concept that's heavily emphasized and considered. Uh, what does it mean to uh, to you to see this uh, growing acknowledgement? For minority communities uh, like Mexican Americans in the film sec in the film sector, um, considering Salt of the Earth's message um, on silencing the Mexican American experience, has today's film industry 
uh, sufficiently up, uh, uplifted these communities or is there still more work to be done? So kind of a, a, a question in terms of thinking about this film as being in the 1950s compared to the present moment. Um, could you condense that question a little bit? Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think the last sentence probably sums it up nicely. So has today's film industry sufficiently uplifted these communities as salt of the earth salt to do, uh, salt to do? Or is there still more work to be done in, in your opinion? Well, there's always, there's always the need for more and more diverse representations from any community uh, residing in the United States, the Latino community, the Mexican American community, the Chicano, Chicana community, all of them need more. There needs to be more to, uh, to sort of accurately or more completely, I'd say to more completely render some, uh, some uh, view of those communities. Uh, so there's never, there's not enough. Uh, I think we shouldn't lose track of salt of the earth because of what it did in such an unprecedented way when it appeared. And we should also understand it in that way. You know, I was mentioning when we talked before that David Riker and Moctezuma Sparza, Moctezuma Sparza is a very accomplished Chicano filmmaker um, from the night, you know, who still at work, but he did films like Walk Out. Walk Out might be a, a film to consider in juxtaposition to Salt of the Earth. Um, and he did uh, Milagro Beanfield War and some other. Well, that, that group, uh, Riker and, and Moctezuma Sparso, several years ago, wanted to do a remake of Salt of the Earth. And this here is where I just, I just, I, I melt down with that because I can't understand what that remake would be since so many of the variables and the, and the impulses that created the film reside in the time in which the film was made. You know, the, the, the red baiting, the blacklisting, the, the, the women, what they used to call the women's question and it's uh, the social problem uh, films, minorities as uh, uh, path Pathology, uh, pathology within the United States. All of those things that Salt of the Earth sort of corrected for uh, came together because of this convergence of things. Now, uh, I think um, I think we should pay tribute to Salt of the Earth. I'm not really sure. I just can't see what the a, a remake would, would be like. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely. But I'd have to see the remake before I could really <laughs> pass. So I, I, I absolutely agree with you about it. Um, so this kind of circles back to the question in regards to unions. This is something we chatted about the other day. Um, so Trinankar uh, Banerjee asked, before Salt of the Earth, uh, the Workers Film and Photo League was heavily invested in uh, the 1930s and making documentaries on strike labor movements around the, U around the U.S., showing them to farm workers, laborers around the U.S. Um, are there any such influences that you found in your research in terms of an organization like this on Beaverbin? Um, yeah, in, in terms of kind of Beaverman's involvement with unions prior, if that's something that's factored into your research at all. Uh, to be uh, to be a quite honest, I, didn't, I haven't run into that kind of uh, uh, information, uh, and and that uh, so I don't know. I'm not I'm not really sure. Uh, is that there are there are uh, I, I wanted to mention a colleague at at UNM uh, who. Uh, has a uh, salt of the earth oral history project going. This is Michelle Kells in the English department, and it's a project that we funded out of the Center for Regional Studies, and that work is available online. So um, I know that the uh, Union Hall in Silver City is is there. It's an edifice, a building that's uh, owned by the union, and that there are uh, documents and other things that folks um, are studying that come that relate to the union and I suppose some amount of it would, would also be about the film or the making of the film. I think that's the per, uh, a perfect conclusion to this really um, enriching discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for joining us today. Uh, thank you to, to everyone else in, in the audience. Thank you for your questions.